I'm Jason, and this is Monetize Media. On this show, I interview my business partner and co-host of this show, Kyle Scott. Kyle knew at a very young age that he wanted to be involved with covering sports and giving his slant on a story. From joining a physically mailed baseball newsletter group at the age of four to living in his parents' basement in his mid-20s, Kyle has fought to make his dream a reality. As the co-founder of CrossingBroad.com, Kyle's provided a unique and, at times, irreverent stance on Philadelphia sports. Since 2009, he's built an unbelievably loyal audience that, unbeknownst to them, almost became part of the Barstool sports family. He's broken huge national stories, took on the largest names in Philadelphia sports reporting, and has ultimately built a sports betting affiliate cash machine that led to a $25 million acquisition exit. This was quite a conversation. Kyle admits to breaking down in tears when he thought his business may not recover from a tunnel vision mistake on a specific revenue stream. He walks us through the amazing process of growing Crossing Broad from zero traffic to one of the most popular sports, uh, sports blogs in the country. He also tells how two Crossing Broad readers potentially saved the site with an investment that ended up paying off big for everyone. Kyle is a humble person with an insane drive to be successful. Working with him over the past four years has provided me with many learning experiences that I hope you can pick up on a bit during this show. Let's go on to the interview. All right. This week's guest is a familiar sound to everyone. Kyle Scott. How are we doing, Kyle? I'm a sound effect. I'm doing pretty well. <laughs> so we are doing the intro. Uh, yes, it is weird. It's weird doing anything that is somehow somebody else's normal responsibility and you feel like you have to live up to that. So it's uh, hopefully hopefully the listeners felt like it was up to Kyle Scott standards. So uh, we're going to interview Kyle today. We're going to interview you today. Um, this, this was your idea, which is a really good idea. And I was really happy to do the one where you asked me a million questions and I felt like I went a lot deeper than I probably would have ever thought I would have gone in, in terms of my origin story up to up till now. So I feel like now it's your turn to be in the hot seat a little bit and give us the whole origin story of how you know you got to Crossing Broad and where how it started and walk us through that that uh, that whole process. Yeah, um, yeah, the seat is a little bit warm. Um, <laughs> so I. I I had always wanted to get into some sort of media. I remember like, you know, and I'll run through like the background quick, but when I was little, my dad, you know, bring him a work laptop. And I remember sitting in a, like Microsoft word or word perfect or whatever hell it was those days. And I was building out like a newsletter or a magazine about, I don't know, whatever I was into the day, we probably Ninja Turtles. Right. And I was doing like a newsletter about what, how Leonardo saved so-and-so. So it was always like my default was I'm going to like, I like, I like news media publications. Like I, I was, I was a nerd. Right. But I, that's what I would do sometimes in my free time was put those things together. And I was a big sports fan and big grown up in Philadelphia, a huge Philadelphia sports fan. And I always just from a young age, like I was more interested in the announcers, Harry Callis of the Phillies, um, you know, watching when when all those regional sports networks started launching, Philly was one of the first markets in the nineties. And, you know, I consumed every bit of that and I was obsessed with sports and all of that. So I always wanted to do something in sports media. So I go to college and, um, you know, I, I had a communications major, but I was never really like super focused and career focused. I was like, Hey, I'm going to, it's going to work out. I'm going to do something in sports media. I get an internship at Comcast Sportsnet the Philly, the Philly station. And I realized quickly, like, I don't want to do this because you got to work, um, you know, a hundred hours a week in sports happen in the evenings and weekends. And most of the people for every Dan Patrick, there's 10,000 people behind the scenes that are making entry level wages, working shitty hours. Um, you know, and I was like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to have to go to Iowa no offense to people in Iowa and Kansas and Nebraska, but that's what you did. If you wanted to be in any sort of media, you kind of hop around to small markets and work your way back. And I was like, I, I don't know if I have that in me to be honest. So I had this internship. It was cool. I got to go in like the locker rooms for the teams. I got to see a, a sports broadcast on, on a, in a major market. 
And I was like, I don't know if I want to work in this though. I'm not even sure if I have this in me to be on TV and I wasn't a great writer. So I was never going to work at a newspaper. So after college, but I knew I still wanted to be in sports media. So after college, I get a job at the Inquirer, the Philadelphia Inquirer as a sales guy, mistakenly thinking that I can get in to sales and then somehow cross over to editorial. Or if anyone who's worked at a mainstream media outlet, sales and, and the business side are very different than the editorial side. Um, so that never worked. But I did learn a lot about selling advertising for media. And the, the internet is 2005, 2006. The paper wasn't really focused on the internet, which is baffling, but they were focused on direct mail, which should tell you all you need to know about why newspapers are you know, continuing to fail. 2005 wasn't like, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the early period of the internet, like it existed then the broadband was a thing. Anyway, um, I learned about selling online, had a few sales jobs after that, had a job at an affiliate marketing agency, worked at GSI commerce, working on the major league baseball online store, which is kind of now sort of become part of fanatics. Um, so I learned a lot about selling advertising, affiliate marketing, um, and selling products on the internet. And then I, I always wanted to do sports media. So I had just constantly started different blogs. And finally, I started this one in 2009 called Crossing Broad. The sports, um, Phillies were really good in Philadelphia. The Eagles were good. The Flyers were good. It was a good time to kind of like start that. And, uh, and I figured if I could just get an audience, I've learned enough over these last five to six years about how to, how to make money on the internet, you know, selling things, advertising, whatever. Let me just see if I can get an audience on my own, skip steps one through seven of going to, uh, you know, Iowa and Kansas as a, you know, local high school football reporter and just start writing about the big teams in a big market. And that's, you know, it's kind of how the, the genesis of the site. You're at GSI, you, you, you know, this is probably not your future career path, right? So how do you, how do you come up with the name? Crossing broad. I mean, I, I know, but just walk me through that process. But then also to do when you know, you're going to go and start, you know, the blog at the time, you know, at the, you know it's, it's kind of funny too. the way we viewed the word blog back then versus now is a little different too. Did you look at it as, as like a story, like it was your opportunity to tell a story and give your slant on things. Cause that was what I heard too. Like when you, you were mentioning with, like when you were a kid, like in your brain, you were saying like newsletter and creativity, but in my brain, I was hearing like, you like to write stories or give your slant on a story. I just, I think this kind of walk us through like that, that beginning process there for crossing broad. Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of timing, I was at GSI and then I went, some guys who had, who'd worked at GSI started an affiliate agency. I didn't know them, but I eventually got a job there. So that's where I was when I started the site. And one of the things I learned there. I was pairing brands with blogs and deal and coupon sites, right? All these big affiliates kind of in the, in the mid two thousands there. And I was seeing there was, there was, you know, we worked with like slick deals and it was founded by, I think two guys out in Vegas. And I remember my boss saying, yeah, these guys are driving around in Lambos. And we, I saw the checks that just our clients were cutting to these guys, you know, five figure, five figure monthly checks from a single, we were working with like Crocs. Right. And they were putting deals for Crocs on their websites. And we were the agency. And I was like, we are paying these guys. I'm just making up a number, but it was like 50,000 a month. Right. I mean, big. And they got hundreds of brands on their website. How much money are these guys making? So that's when I really learned about affiliate marketing. And I was like, wow, if I know enough about sports apparel from GSI. So if I can grow a sports brand, I could, if nothing else, sell. Phillies jerseys and Eagles jerseys as an affiliate. And I'm like doing the math and, you know, $10 a shirt you'll get. And I was like, this could be my business model. So that was when I got the confidence to be like, okay, if I can get an audience, I'll figure out how to make money off of it. Cause I, I've seen now what this could be. Um, never thinking it would, I would be staring down, you know, six figure monthly checks. It was just like, Hey, I can make a living off of this is what I want to do. I don't know if I really like telling the stories. Like I just always liked like news and yeah, I guess I liked giving my opinions on things and st my default was things I really like. Like I want to write about it or talk about it. I had my own like little radio show with a broadcaster when I was young. So like this all feels very natural to me. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was, that was pretty much it. And I remember being inspired as a weird story, but 
Tyler Kepner uh, is the New York Times baseball writer. And my first ever Phillies game, I sat next to him as a four-year-old. And he taught, I, I barely remember this. My parents always did. He had his own baseball newsletter in the late 1980s that he would mail to like 30 people. And I was one of those 30 people. And as a kid, I would get this thing in the mail like once every few months. And it would have like stories about the Phillies and baseball. And lo and behold, like at the time, I just knew him as this guy, Tyler. Lo and behold, he winds up becoming the New York Yankees and now the Major League Baseball writer at the New York Times. And that I think that was the thing that like got to see to me. I saw someone who was a little bit older and I was like, wow, I'm getting this. I want to do this. That was the thing that like sort of put that seed of, of creating content, I guess, on the Internet. Or in that case, it was just a, a print newsletter. Nice. That's amazing how how early an impression can be can be made. Yeah, I kind of looked up to the guy. I met him once, and he was like <laughs> ten years older. I was like, oh, this 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 guy's cool, and he's sending me this thing about the Phillies. Like that was that was about it. All right, so let's get into crossing broad here a little bit. I mean, I'm I'm assuming you know you crossed broad once, and like so how you know you did, did, was that it? I, Broad and Patterson is where the stadiums are located for people not not in Philadelphia. So I mean, where I've never actually asked you where the origin truly of the Crossing Broad came from. Yeah, so there's a there used to be a show in Philly called Patterson Ave, I believe. And again, mm -hmm. you know, all the sports complexes are located at the corner of Broad and Broad and Patterson in Philadelphia. So I was like, all right, well that's interesting. I don't I want it to be all sports, so I don't want to name it after a team. Let me choose something with Broad Street. That's pretty obvious. And from the beginning, I always wanted it to be slightly irreverent. Like I never wanted to be, I, I kind of like hated like mainstream reporting. I always wanted to have an opinion and be able to try and be funny or irreverent or aggressive on it, sarcastic. And I thought crossing, I don't know, like the, it worked. It was like, hey, you're crossing a street. And like there was this somewhat unintentional, but maybe slightly intentional you know, like, hey, like I'm doing things a little bit differently than everybody else. Everybody's on Broad Street, like I'm crossing over it and I'm coming in like with a totally different bend that is at least unique to, to this market. And honestly, my rule for domains is it's got to be easy to remember and easy to spell. And I, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of science it was like crossing broad is easy to spell and remember. Yeah. And it's amazing that over the years we've seen crossing board so often, but you know. I had a fake Twitter account called Crossing Board that would like lampoon us for a while. So I don't know, it might still exist. <laughs> you, you created your own critic? No, somebody else. It was, it was somebody oh, else. Okay. They really didn't like us, actually. In hindsight, it was funny, but it used to piss me off. Nice. All right, so walk us through the process then of, of you know, starting this blog. It was, you know, the Phillies are red hot at the time, right? I mean, they're coming off. Uh, was it a World Series appearance and then a win? Or is that... I'm trying to think of where we were and they just had won in 08. It was the end of 2009. So they had won in 08. Okay. They went to the world series in 2010 and then they had just uh, traded for Roy Hall the, the now late Roy Halliday. And so yep. like interest in the Phillies was at an all time high. And I started it literally the day that they, they, they got Halliday. Cause that was like, okay, I, I want to write about this. I'm just doing it. I'm just going to do it. And I did it. And at the time, because they had just signed Halliday, I created a Facebook fan page for Roy Halliday. Just, it was like fans of Roy Halliday. And it wasn't intentional, but a lot of people actually thought it was Roy Halliday, <laughs> right? This is back before like athletes really had like agencies doing their social media and Facebook was more wild, wild west. Um, so I didn't, I wasn't pretending to be him, but people thought it was him and I wasn't going to stop it. And it grew to like 80,000 followers in a few months. So I was like, hmm, you know, these people are just here. They're clicking the like button on Roy Halliday to follow this page. I'm writing blog posts about the Phillies. And I'm like, I'm just posting every single blog post I do on this fan page. And back then, Facebook's algorithm wasn't nearly as aggressive. And you could reach a good chunk of those 80,000 people. So, you know, that's a big part of it. I had started a number of blogs that no one ever read. And you just give up on them. And getting that early traction is the only reason it existed. Cause I would post something and even like right out of the gate, those first weeks I would get 500 to maybe 2000 views on a story because I could just put it in front of this audience. And I was like, okay, I, if I make the content good enough, these people will come back. And, and that's kind of what happened. I was like, I'm just going to do this every day. I know I can get eyeballs on it and I can get feedback and 
Um, some of the stuff we wrote was really aggressive <laughs> and people are like, why are you putting, why is Roy Halliday tweeting this, this, you know, colorful expletive filled blog posts. We were, you know, pretty gruff back then, but, uh, it seeded the audience and gave me yeah. enough confidence to be like, okay, people are seeing this. I'm just going to keep doing it. So for the younger listeners too, I mean, just to reiterate Kyle's point here, Facebook in 09, 2010, the, the ability to kind of, I don't want to use the word abuse, but I mean, you really, these, these Facebook groups had real reach, especially here in a, in a local market like Philadelphia with the hottest team, bringing in one of baseball's you know, best pitchers. I mean, it's, it's hard to um, understate how, how you could utilize Facebook at that time. And also too, there wasn't many other social media channels that were being utilized. I mean, Facebook was the core uh, avenue for social at, the, at that in, in 2010. It was, it was the only one with scale. I think, you know, MySpace had kind of died by that point. So that was that like weird window where it was Facebook and Twitter was, was really just kind of starting out. Um, four other people had created fan pages for him. I just happened to be the one, the first, and I chose like the best photo of him. So it looked like the most official and, and people gravitated towards it. But to your point, I remember doing this for other people. Like <laughs> this, this is really embarrassing, but American Idol was big back then. So mm -hmm. as those contestants would go further in the show, I would create fan pages for them <laughs> trying to, I didn't know what I was going to do with it, but I was like, I can maybe put affiliate links on these pages. You know, it was, it was wild west and not something, you know, you could really do today or, or, you know, you get stamped out pretty quickly. But remember Larry, the pants on the ground, pants, pants on the ground guy from American yeah, Idol. Yeah, yeah. I had his fan page to this day. I will get like a notification once a month <laughs> that somebody, somebody has liked posted. It liked it or posted something on the page. Did you ever hear from the Phillies or anybody, you know, saying like, Hey, this is, this looks a little too official. You know, we're not, we don't love this, uh, representation of Roy and the Phillies. I don't, not from the team. Um, about a year and a half later when Facebook really started to get serious, the way Twitter might be soon about verifying accounts of, of public personalities they actually reclaimed the page and mm. kept it, but I think held it for, you know, these athletes or famous people who wanted to claim it. I don't think he ever did. At some point, I had some sort of exchange with his wife over like a charity thing they were promoting. And I'm pretty sure I, f I floated it like, hey, Facebook reclaimed this, but, you know, it's got a lot of followers. If you guys ever want to use it, here it is. Like, I don't think anything ever came of it. I never heard anything yeah. negative other than from fans who were like, I posted the night he threw a perfect game, like five minutes after the perfect game. They're like, aren't you still on the field? Like people were very new to social media. I wasn't, wow. I wasn't posting as Roy Halliday, but you know, people just saw it and you know, social yeah. again, it was new. People weren't familiar with kind of how it worked and how brands and, and athletes have people managing pages. It was, it was just, you were, you literally created a page to be a fan of something. Like I'm drinking a Fiji water, right? Like you could create a fan page back then for Fiji water. It didn't mean you were Fiji. No one thought you were Fiji. It was just, it was just the way it was. All right. So you, you cracked the first nut of figuring out how to get some traffic, right? In a creative way. So how, walk us through the next step. Like, okay, I wrote something. People see it. Some people might think it's Roy Holiday. But obviously, when they go to Crossing Broad, they realize it isn't. You have your own voice. Walk us through the next step. So I've, I'm getting traffic. You obviously are going to progress to more coverage on, in the city. But also, too, I'm sure the thought in your brain is, how am I, making, how am I going to make money? Yeah. Yeah. So there was a um, Philly and you've, uh, national sports writers have said this, had like the most passionate online community of people on the Internet at the time, um, both in terms of like Twitter and over the years, Twitter, blogs, podcasts, right? Philly is such an incredible sports market that there's n so much online content. Uh, and at the time, there was a lot of Philly's blogs in particular. You know, blogs were big then. Um, and But they all, like, shared links. You know, they were all friends, and they all had their own zoo with Roy. You know, you had, like, these satirical ones. You had these funny ones. You had these serious, like, baseball stats ones. But they were all friends and deferred to each other and all did it as a hobby. And I was always started it like 50, 50. I like doing this. I like doing content, but
but I want to work for myself. Like I was pretty good at my jobs. I know you and I have talked in the past when I would start a new job and I would apply myself, you know, bosses would like me. I was, you know, I was good at like what I did, but I hate, then I would see the money coming in and I would hate that someone else was benefiting from that while I was making $42,000 a year. I, I hated it. And then, and the affiliate agency was, or really put it over the edge. Cause I worked for two owners, great guys, by the way, learned a lot from them, but I was making a salary. I could see that the affiliate partners were getting these big paychecks and then my bosses were building this growing agency. And I was like, I'm just a cog in the wheel here. So I started the site knowing I wanted it to become a business. I wasn't sure how, but it was like, if I get enough eyeballs and readers, I, at the worst case, I could sell advertising, do affiliate products. The other bloggers hated me for that because I would write about the same things they did. I didn't just defer to them because they covered some sort of quirky thing that happened on TV. So I was just like, boom, boom, boom. Like, I'm going to post every link. I got this cheat code in this Facebook fan page that I can get the audience from. And I set up Chartbeat, which is a, a similar to real-time Google Analytics, if you're not familiar with it. And it was very early in those days. So I would post a link on that Facebook page and I would see there'd be two people on the site and that would jump to 40 people like instantly in real time. And then I did a couple of things that would get picked up by some of the bigger blogs like Barstool or Deadspin and they would link back. And I would see 40 jump up to 60 or 80 or 100 or NBC's like pro football talk, you know, maybe a year or two later would link to our stuff and it would jump even more. And it would be fleeting. It would be for an hour or two and then it would go away. But seeing that, it was it was literally like a drug. When yep. you would see the real-time stats go up, it was, I guarantee it was activating the same spot in, in my brain as, as a drug would or as nicotine would. And then you just wanted to keep doing that. And this might not be healthy, but it's really the way social media algorithms are designed. So I just kept trying to feed that meter and find things that would that would spike interest like that. It's also a reason I think why we see such high turnover and failure, especially at that time period in sports blogs and, and, you know, interest type blogs, because I think people confuse the success of traffic with monetization, you know, and at some point you have to move away from, yes, this is great and it feels good and there's attention, but how are you paying the bills? Right. And, and I, I think we saw that happen so often. Um, so at what point do you kind of have that same process? Like, this is great and this is cool. And it's, it's hitting all those great parts of my brain that make me feel good. But then obviously you have to move on to, I got to make a living. Yeah. Uh, so once we got some time, like within that first year, I was still working, still at the job and I would get up, you know, I, it was my goal to get something on the website every day by 9 a.m. Because I knew at that time, most blogs weren't businesses. And you'd like to read some stuff and there would be five, seven days in between posts. And it's like, all right, I can't check this every day. The only thing I checked every day was like Bill Simmons because I knew he had X number of columns per week and it was reliable and I could eat lunch on Fridays and read his mailbag, you know? So I was like, I'm going to get something up, even if it's not that good, every day by 9 a.m. And then every day by lunchtime and then at least three, four posts a day. I would do it in the mornings at night. So once we got a couple of thousand views per day, say we, it was I, um, I, I put programmatic ads on AdSense. There was a sports blog, like tailored one, you know, all that stuff. And it was making like a couple hundred bucks a month. Um, I tried affiliate stuff. I tried creating my own shirts on Spreadshirt. I tried selling direct ads. I did an event at a bowling alley in Philly. And I thought I was going to have all these people come out. I had two people show up or six. It was me, my girlfriend, her brother and cousin, and then two readers. And it was really embarrassing, but it was like four months into the site. And I thought, wow, I'm getting like a thousand page views a day. I'm going to have this huge turnout. And a thousand page views a day in hindsight is, is not a lot. Yep. So I tried everything instantly. I, in, in hindsight, I probably should have waited a bit till I got like a more of a critical mass to do anything beyond programmatic. But I was, I was trying every single model we'll talk, we talk about on here selling t-shirts, being an affiliate, programmatic ads, events. And it was just, it was just too early. But by the end of the year, I was able to piece together, you know, the equivalent of like 10 to $15,000 a year. Uh, and it, I, I had moved home to save money. I was like 25, 26. I was in apartments. I moved home to save money, met a girlfriend and I went to my parents. I was like, I think I'm going to quit my job and do this. And 
I had some battles with my dad, who's a very understanding guy and supportive, but he's like, Kyle, like you, you're 26, you moved home. I can't have you quitting your job. Like I'm off the hook for you. Like, you know, and, and that was a thing. And I sort of maybe fudged the numbers that I was like, would be able to replicate my salary, which at the time was like 50, 55,000. Uh, you know, in reality it was like 10 to 12,000. I was going to make that first year. Um, so yeah, yeah. I was in, I used to do the same thing with Danielle. I would, you know, you would, you would kind of quote your revenue number and make it out like, you know what I mean? I'd be like, ah, I'm going to do all right. I'm going to do all right. It's going to be this number. But like, yeah, I knew in my brain, I was barely, I was barely making anything in terms of profit, but just to kind of like, just, just give me a minute. You know, it sounds like that was kind of a similar situation with your, with your dad. If you choose like the best day, you know, in programmatic rates that you have like in a year, I'm like, all right, well, I just take that and times it by 365. It's a good yeah. number knowing that like it was an outlier day. Yeah. Yeah. So I started making a little bit of money by the end of the year after about doing it for a year. I, but I knew I had something and I was like, I, this is good. I'm growing an audience. We, we were very colorful. It was like very TMZ. We would write about what the players were doing in their free time, you know, stuff that social media takes care of now. Twitter takes care of an athlete at a bar doing something goofy. That wasn't happening then, but it would show up on Twitter or social media somewhere, but it would never get traction. So I would search these things out, find them and be the only one posting about them. And that's what, you know, people wanted to read it. It was gossipy and the sites evolved since then, but it got us readers. And I was, uh, you know, I was making enough to eventually after a number of conversations, you know, convince again i was 20 this is embarrassing like i was literally a, a blogging in my parents basement and then i i convinced them to let me quit my job and the deal was like don't ever ask us for money you could live here which is a safety net that you know a lot of people don't have and i you certainly can't do this with a wife and kids but i had the safety net of you have a we're not going to kick you out of our house but beyond that don't ask us for money you know for food and things like that like you pay for your stuff live here and do it, but figure it out quickly. The irony of you living in the basement, I can tell our listeners. So, you know, I would listen to, to uh, I guess it was 610 WIP sports talk here. And, you know, what was happening was Kyle, you were scooping people, you know, you were getting, you were getting information. Um, and then one of the largest personalities here in Philadelphia at the time was Howard Eskin. And I remember hearing him just bitching and moaning about these, these bloggers, these, and he would say, he would be like, these, these bloggers in their pajamas in their parents' basement, you know? And like, and I sit there and be like, you know, I, okay, but you know, they're scooping you. Like they're, they're more aggressive than you. Like you're, you know, but now in hearing you describe your, you know, your, your situation, I mean, he was, he was calling it right, but, I think in the end, he was probably jealous of what maybe, you know, he saw coming and we all saw coming that there was this new avenue in journalism that was, you know, was going to be sensationalized. It was TMZ like to your point and people really wanted to see it and search for it and it wasn't being covered. So, you know, you saw an opportunity, you went out and get it and it continues to to hit and hit and hit. I know there's some stories about some you know, people down and down the shore and some crazy stories. Maybe we won't talk about, or we can, I don't know. Yeah. But then do we want to jump into like the big hit or is there something before that? I don't, I don't want to say it like, you know? Yeah, no. I, but I, so I think that the blogger in the basement thing was a stereotype and I used to get mad at it. Right. But it was true. I would get mad yeah. because I always felt like this is working. I could see our traffic going up. And slowly but surely was making a little bit more money each month, right? Traffic was going up. We had the programmatic ads. And I knew I was on to something. And the, the site was good. Um, and then I would hear these mainstream people say, hey, it's just a guy in his basement. I would get mad even though they were 100% right. Um, I was literally blogging in my pajamas in my parents' basement. Like, no exaggeration. And we lucked out. The week I quit my job and the week after... The Phillies, you know, it doesn't matter if people listening. They went and signed Cliff Lee. It was another big picture. 
And it was like the city was over themselves. Like how we finally had a baseball team that was spending like the Yankees. Like that was the gist. And our traffic doubled. We had the people submitting memes to us and photoshops of like the Phillies. And it was just a very happy time. It was around Christmas. It was a week after I quit my job. And it was like a gift from the, a content gift from the gods and traffic doubled. And some of our, the stuff our readers were sending to us was winding up on local news. So I'm watching Fox Philly and they're showing and crediting our website on the news. And on the radio, they're talking, hey, go at this site. They have all these funny pictures. You know, this is before social media was really a thing. And our blog was sort of like a, a hub for people who were creating stuff and commenting. It was living on our site and we were aggregating all this stuff. And um, that was like the moment where I was like, listen, I know I'm in my parents' basement here. Like all these critiques are correct, but we're, you know, I'm working 80 hours a week. I'm out working these people. People are sending us tips. We're finding stuff online that people, mainstream reporters weren't looking for at the time. You know, they're going through normal PR channels. They're showing up to press conferences. And I'm there searching for, you know, Philadelphia Flyers players in a bar, right? I'm literally searching their name on Twitter and then putting bar and drinks and towns, right? And lo and behold, one random person would take a picture of a player doing something not even scandalous, just like having fun. And we would write like these satirical posts about it and it would give us traction. And then we'd start commenting on the games. And I know some of the athletes were reading it and yeah, like it was enough traction, you know, to be like, okay, I think I'm on to something here and, you know, and can figure out a way to turn it into a business. Um, but I wasn't thinking like, you know, 95% of the day was like creating cool content and not like, how do I monetize it? I was like just resting on programmatic ads, which was, you know, not the right decision in hindsight. At that time, how many posts per day do you think you were doing? Some days I personally would do 10. Um, usually we were like between six and eight and I would have a few like free contributors, but, um, you'll find that I think anyone listening here is good advice. If having a free contributor is not, uh, something you can rely on long-term, you know, people want to right and especially in sports fans want to put their voice out there it's why people call sports talk radio but you can't actually rely on these people like you you have to pay people to rely on them but it was mostly just me so probably six to eight posts per day okay so the city's booming the phillies are booming sports is is, is booming it, it obviously helps in philadelphia too there's there's an awesome sports radio competition going on between uh wip and i believe was i don't, I don't know if it was 97.5 at that time i think it was 97.5 i think was live for espn radio and so it helps everything is kind of being fostered along you're you're you are in the you are in the ether of everything that's going on in philadelphia so what is the event that happens that you think takes it to you know the next level and and i mean i I, I have an idea, I think, of what it is, but is that event the core thing that took it to the next level, or do you think it was a mix? It, it, was, it was, I think it was actually a mix. So, you know, th this is, so what I just described was like 2010 to 2012. I eventually buy a house with my girlfriend, now wife, who was the reason I started the site. You know, I had met her right about when I started it, and I told her about it, and I was like, if this, if this woman, I, like, I think I really, think I think this is the one, right? If she thinks it's dumb, I'm not doing it. And to her credit, she was like, this is cool. Like, you seem like you have a long-term plan for this. Do it. Um, so anyway, she was very supportive. Finally move out of my parents' basement. We buy a small house together. So now I'm blogging on um, the second floor, still in pajamas. But um, a couple of years go by doing it that way. And um, to again, we were kind of always doing things different than the mainstream media. We were looking for angles. And um, a Philadelphia Eagles player, Riley Cooper... Uh, goes to a Kenny Chesney concert at Lincoln Financial Field, which is the stadium the Eagles um, play in. And someone gets him on camera, drop in uh, the N-word at a security guard. Um, you know, and at the time, that summer, there was a number of, like, race-related things in the news. Um, uh, Paula Dean, I think, had had some sort of scandal. There was another one. You know, obviously, there's been there's been a lot of unearthing of this stuff since, but at the time it was, it was a hot button topic. And here you have this like middling NFL player saying the worst word you could possibly say on camera. 
and someone's like, I have a video of this. Do you want it? And I was like, geez, like this, I need to verify this. Um, and he's like, um, you know, how much are you willing to pay? <laughs> and, <laughs> and this is like two, three years in. And I'm like, well, you know, I still wasn't making a lot of money. I was probably, you know, maybe going to piece together like thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year. It wasn't, you know, it still wasn't replicating at least my old salary. Thankfully, you know, my girlfriend at the time, you know, had a normal job, but I was, I couldn't spend thousands. He was looking for thousands of dollars. I was like, I don't have it. You know, I was like, I'll give you 150 bucks. And he shopped it around. He took it to the local sports talk radio station. And the, one of the big hosts in Philly a guy, Mike Missinelli. And he's like, we can't, you know, they're partnered with the Eagles. Again, this is the stuff that independent media can do. You know, the, the, the local sports talk radio station wanted nothing to do with it because they had a partnership to do post game shows with players. And they knew this was a thing. And he's like, you should go to these guys at crossing broad. And so the guy's like, listen, no one else wants it. I'll take your 150. Here's the video. And, uh, I remember getting it and I, I looked at it and I was like, it looks real. It's bad. You know, it looks real and it looks bad. And I sent it to like a couple of friends who were like developers and knew some stuff about video editing. I was like, this is real guys, right? Like this isn't the audio hasn't been dubbed. This is pretty damning. And they're like, no, this is legit. So I posted on the website. Um, and within five minutes, one of the Eagles reporters, like I'm reaching out for the team for comment. And I'm thinking, I'm like, I know this is going to be a story locally, but no one has ever heard of this guy, Riley Cooper. He was like the third string receiver on a middling Eagles team at that point. I completely underestimated how big of a deal it was just that he was in the NFL and someone was using this word on camera, right? I mean, he's, you know, you know, I imagine certainly more than half of NFL players are black, right? And he's using this word. Two hours later, I have voice. I wasn't even looking at my phone. I was, you know, focusing on the website and like interacting with the Twitter response. And I got a call from ESPN. Like, can we use this and credit you? The sports center, like news desk. And I didn't even see it for 90 minutes. So I call back. I'm like, yeah, you know, use it. Please credit me. And for the next two days on the bottom line of sports of ESPN, just in general, is every 90 seconds crossing broad.com is just running across, you know, Eagles video caught using racial slur obtained by crossing broad.com. And our traffic just goes through the roof when that happened for, I wish it was a different story. It was, you know, I mean, there was nothing good about that story, right? Um, you know, the player wound up getting suspended. He eventually came back to the team, but ultimately it, it definitely impacted his career. He bounced around after that, but, um, you know, it, it, we hit on a, a hot button issue at the time. So that gave us like some prominence, but within a week, our traffic was back to just about where it was, you know, it maybe had like a 10% overall increase, but you know, for people listening, it's worth remembering if you do get a viral hit, don't conflate that with it being equal to long-term success. Yeah. A viral hit might spike your traffic, your audience, your downloads, your views, but you better keep, you'll get some new people in, but then you got to keep giving them stuff that is interesting. Otherwise you're never going to get them back. So during that time period of a couple of days, are you, do you have any, cons any legal concerns about the, you know, post what you did posting it, anything like that? I feel like I would have knowing my personality, I've been like, oh my God, did I, you know, did I move too fast with this? Did I, did I confuse, you know, the ability to get attention and grow this with putting myself in legal hot water? Um, I was more concerned before I posted it. And again, granted, it was like a four hour window between when I had the video and posted is, you know, for better or worse, there was a lack of editorial oversight when it's just one guy and you have tens of thousands of, uh, readers. I was concerned that it wasn't real. You know, I knew mm -hmm. enough just when anyone who's in business for themselves knows you can't always pay a lawyer, but when you have these questions about like, can I use an image? Can I use X? Can I use Y? You just kind of force yourself to learn enough like legal basics. So I knew slander and libel were out if it was true, right? Like, so my concern initially was I need to make sure this video is real because if it's not real, that's where I have a legal problem. And I did have enough confidence in that. Like, you know, we ran it through video editors. Like, is there any way this could be dubbed? And it was so obvious that it was, it was a real video. Um, after I posted it, I was less concerned about the legal aspect 
my only concern was that the guy who sent me the video was like, we didn't really have a documentation. I sent him like 150 bucks in PayPal. I was like, is this college kid who had the video going to sue me because I'm getting attention for this video that he had? That was my real legal. That was my legal concern. Nothing to do with the Eagles or the player. Cause it was real. And like it happened in a public space and you know, it, that, that part wasn't a concern. You now have gone in a, in a relatively short time period from not sure what you're doing with your life to starting crossing broad, impersonating Roy Halliday a, a bit on Facebook, not intentionally, unintentionally. Um, there's a definite movement afoot for crossing broad traffic is there. This is a national story. So, I mean, locally you have now created a blog slash brand that is known for being irreverent, breaking stories, but also now has hit on something very big nationally. Um, walk us through, I guess, that next, because the next step in the evolution, I mean, you have gone from, if we're looking at a scale of zero to 10, you've gone from zero to, I would say like six, six and a half, pretty quickly, you know, so how does it, how does the next step in the evolution come about? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, like now we got the time, I don't know, probably 60% of where the traffic is today. Like it kind of grew quickly and then just grew slow, you know, slowly after that, because I'm, I think I actually made a number of mistakes after that early on, I was good at finding like these like little hacks to get audience, the Facebook page, right. Writing about things that no one else was writing about. You being resourceful and finding cool stories. And, and, you know, I quickly grew to an audience. That was the moment where I was like, oh my God, our audience is big enough where if I post something, and I was reckless early on, I would post sarcastic, sarcastic opinions, innuendo, things that in hindsight, like I would think twice about publishing because could it be damaging to this person? We never did anything that was gratuitous, but there are definitely things I would censor in the, the later years that I wasn't in the beginning. And that was the, the Riley Cooper story was the moment I was like, Oh my God, like there's enough audience here that if I hit publish on something that has newsworthiness, like I don't need to do anything. Like it's just going to get out there. I didn't send that to people. It just, you know, we had enough relevance in the city. Um, but that's where I start. I think I made some mistakes where if I was smart at that point, I would have created more, uh, thoughtful distribution channels. I just relied on at that point, word of mouth. Like we were kind of, I don't say viral locally, but we got a lot of attention locally for being different. I'd get invited to, you know, come on sports talk radio. I did some like local sports talk TV shows. Like I was loving it because here I always wanted to be the sports media guy and I was making myself relevant in Philly sports media. I was on the, the morning sports talk drive time show. Sometimes it was, it was cool. Right. Um, but I still wasn't making that much money. Like as a business, I was having fun. And, you know, I remember writing on a whiteboard in 2013, 70,000. That was my goal for the year. And I was like late twenties. It was a respectable, you know, it was a respectable salary, but I wasn't thinking about scaling the business. I was like, how do I make myself $70,000 this year? I would be thrilled. I was 28, 29, whatever. Um, what I should have done at that point was really think about, SEO wasn't doing no SEO wasn't even a thought in my mind. We would promote our stuff on social. We had our fans. I should have thought about SEO. I thought should have thought more about like strategic affiliate. My affiliate efforts at that point was I worked with a local t-shirt company. They would create a new shirt. I'd write a blog post about it and I'd get 10, I get $2 and 50 cents a shirt, you know, hundred dollar hundreds of dollar opportunities, not thousands or tens of thousands. And at that point I had to scale where I should have been thinking about that stuff. So it kind of grew slowly after that, just consistently creating content. I eventually found this thing where, where everything sort of changed from a business perspective is Google, uh, released this thing called Google consumer surveys. And if you watch videos on YouTube, you'll still see them. You'll have to answer like two survey questions. I never answered them by the way, and you'll hear why, um, and they're basically businesses will go to Google. They have market research they want to do. So they put, submit their questions to Google 
and they pay 10 cents per response. And at the time, five cents would go to Google, naturally, and five cents would go to publishers who posted them on their websites. And it was Google's solution to a paywall. So instead of having people, now people are accustomed to paying for content online, but they weren't then. So some local, new, they created them for like small local newspapers. And I was one of the blogs that used them. And people would have to answer one or two of these questions before they could read the website. And because we had such a loyal audience, my contact at Google, this is like a small program at Google, told me I was one of their highest earning publishers. We were doing like $500 a day, you know, pretty quickly because our readers knew what they were. They liked the site and they're like, hey, I can answer. They probably were lying on their answers, but I can answer two questions to access this content. And I just rested on that. Our audience was growing. Now I'm making, you know, like low six figures enough to hire someone as like a full-time freelancer. So I'm just focused on content and was sort of just relying on this, this Google thing that I thought was just going to last forever. Um, it didn't like it lasted for two years. I felt good. My income was decent. And then out of nowhere, Google being Google decides, you know what, we're, we have our own content. We're going to put these on YouTube videos and in like some of their Google play games or apps or whatever. And we'll take both sides of that five cent transaction. We'll take all 10 cents. And that was the point where my revenue went from, you know, like 180 to 200,000 a year down to like 30,000, like overnight back to where I was five years earlier. So that's, is this, you know, in our interview, looking at some of my background, does, does panic, does panic set in here at that point? Like, oh shit, like I've, I've built this up. I, I felt like I probably hit a point where well, you're getting comfortable, but you have a career trajectory most likely. Right. And then, you know, Google, Google has completely rugs you. Yeah. It's a good lesson for never put all your eggs in one basket, no matter how good the basket is. And at the time it was a great basket. You know, here I am, I'm writing a sports blog. I'm doing what I, what I love. And fa this is fast forwarding a few years, like 2016, 2017. I get married, we buy a bigger house, we have a kid, and then the Google thing happens. And I had all my eggs in this basket. And it sucked because I was like, wow, I'm making six figures to be a sports blogger and be relevant and do some of these things I like that I always wanted to do. And by the way, to anyone who knows anything about journalist salaries, you know, most of them are making six figures unless you're on national television or you've been doing it for 40 years. So I was making more than the people who were covering the Eagles for the local newspaper. So I felt like I had won, but I had all my eggs in this one product from Google. And when that gets rugged, that was, you know, we talk about the moment where you feel like you're going to, that was it because, you know, this was no longer, I was no longer living with my parents. I was no longer unmarried and dating and, and by, you know, living in a small house. We had a larger house. We had, my wife had quit her job because I was making enough and we had a, one year old at home. And when, you know, your income basically gets cut by 80% overnight, I was like, I don't know how to piece that back together because I haven't been thinking about it. I was just relying on it and I was thinking about content and I wasn't like, wow, how do I diversify revenue? So if one thing gets cut off, I don't get screwed. All I had to fall back on was programmatic ads, which were paying, you know, three, 4,000 bucks a month at the time. So that was the moment where I was flailing and like, I need to figure this out or I'm, I, unfortunately I got to go now get a nine to five job. And to further paint that picture too, normally in that age group, that age bracket, you're probably a little more aggressive too in your mortgage and what you're going for. Life feels like it's, you know, going extremely well. So for that to happen, it, it, it's, it is a, it is a big hit. I mean, I, was there as well. It, it, it is so concerning. How long does it take you mentally you know, to kind of recover from that jab and say, okay, I, I think I have an avenue uh, to continue doing what I love, but also now, you know, support my family and, and, and move this thing uh, down the line. So yeah, you, you go through like the five stages of grief, right? The, I don't know what order they come, but like one was denial. So because this, this was a small program at Google and it was born out of like their labs, Google gives its employees or used to, I don't know if they still do like 20% of their time to tinker, build new things. And this, 
bore out of that, if I'm using that phrase right. So I had an actual contact at Google, a human being that I could call. And they had like 100 publishers in this program, 200, whatever. And I was one of the top ones. And they were working with local newspapers. But they're like, your click-through rate is like 40% of people complete these surveys. On average, the newspapers were getting like 8%. And it was because I had this loyal audience and they knew it was like, hey, I like this site. I'm going to support it. I have to answer these questions. We were very open to people that it was a key part of our business. And so I remember calling him and being like, what the hell? (laughs) What's going on? And he's like, listen, it's not me. You know, this is big company. You want to talk about how big companies can be, I don't say evil, right? But they lose their way. This was a program that was actually created as a solution for small publishers. And it was working, it was really good. But Google's like, screw it. You know, they see the dollars and they're like, we have our own content, YouTube, you know, all this stuff. Let's just put these survey, this, this inventory on our content and stop paying the publishers for this, you know? And he's like, the decision's above my head. And he's like, I have had a fight for this program. He's like, I used you personally as an example of what the impact of Google changing this policy makes, you know, to actual people. You know, I told him, I was like, dude, I am going to lose my business over this. You know, shame on me for putting my eggs in the basket, but you know, you guys are screwing publishers and people. Um, and what, you know, so Google can make an extra, you know, 70 grand, you know, it's not, Mm -hmm. this isn't like they're, you know, $5 billion market opportunity. This is a, a rounding error of rounding errors for them. And he's like, listen, I made the case. He's like, well, you know, you'll get some inventory, but 95% of the inventory for these survey questions is going to Google owned properties and the rest will filter out to our publishers. So it, it literally went from $500 a day to two. So I first is grief. I'm fighting it. And then it's like, okay, I'm scrambling. I have to do something. And so I'm looking, there were other versions of this out there, but none is good. None is easy to implement. I'm trying it. I'm looking at other ad networks. I'm looking for affiliate opportunities. Somewhere you will find a post about HelloFresh on Crossing Broad, a HelloFresh review. Like I was looking for high paying affiliate programs, you know, and I was able to piece together like a couple hundred dollars here and there. I'm trying to sell direct ads. I launched a micro ads thing where I set up like, hey, you can sponsor individual posts for like 50 bucks. Because I knew at the time we're doing about 10 posts per day. And if I could get 10 sponsors per day, 50 bucks, little business, small businesses can sponsor it. And it was actually a good idea and it was well received, but I failed again. Like I made a lot of mistakes here. I failed to neglect how much it's easier to service one big client than like 15 small clients per week. Cause I got, you know, mom and pop shops, PayPaling me money. And here's what I want to sponsor this post for. And, but you do what you have to, right. And I was piecing together. I wasn't piecing together all of it, but I made up like, couple thousand a month just to like, you know, plugging things together, pressing buttons, finding what works, you know? Um, but I realized like, okay, this isn't sustainable. You know, I, this isn't like fantasy land anymore. I have a wife, a kid, a a decent sized mortgage based on that six figure salary I was making, you know? Um, I either need to go get a job, do something on the side or figure something else out. And I, I was like, I'm going to give it a shot. And I remember coming home. I went to a sports uh, media conference at Villanova University. And Erica Nardini spoke there. And she was about a year into her time at Barstool. And I was like the lowest of lows. And, you know, we didn't talk about in this podcast, but way back in 2010, kind of buried part of the lead here, Dave Portnoy had asked me to start Barstool Philly. Like, a year into this site, right after I quit my job, I actually had that opportunity and I turned it down because I wanted to do my own thing. And here I am seven years later, seeing the CEO of Barcel is now hugely successful speak um, at my college, by the way, I went to Villanova. Unfortunately, yeah. I'm at the lowest of lows, you know, trying to find ideas to make my site work. And I'm staring, I was like, oh man, maybe I should have taken that opportunity seven years ago. So I come home that day and it was probably the only time like work related where like I cried, like I got Mm -hmm. home, I saw my wife, she was in there with our one-year-old, one and a half year old son. And that same day I had to let go of that full-time equivalent freelancer. You know, they were basically like a full-time employee, you know, and 
online world, everyone's a contractor, right? But they've been with me for two and a half years. And, you know, it's a big moment when you feel like you're employing somebody. But I was yeah. like, I, I, I have to survive. I have to let this person go. So I let this person go. I went to the conference. I came home. And I told my wife, I was like, hey, I had to let so-and-so go. And I remember just like, you know, she could see I was like, I was getting upset. And I was like, I screwed this up. Like I, I had this audience. I got an audience. It's a great site. It was making money. And now it's not. And I have no idea what to do. So that was, you know, that was definitely the moment where you're like, well, this, this is it, you know? And so that's rock, that's rock bottom. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty, you know, it's, you know, it's only five years ago, but, uh, I figured, all right, well, I gotta, I'm going to fight for this, right? Like it's, it's, I'm not just going to give up on it. Let me give it four months. I could, I can get by for a few months if I figure it out. This is a very common thing to pick a timeline to give, you know, to give yourself oh, a deadline, to give yourself, to get something going. It's. I feel like very successful people do this. They say, it's got to be this or I'm going to go try something different. Yeah. So I, I think that was April. It was conference was in April. I got rugged by Google in February. So for, and I flailed for a month and then I was like, all right, I got to let go of the, the person in April. And that was when I was like, I got, I basically give myself the summer to figure it out. Right. Football season get, got busy for that sort of business. And I was like, I need to have a plan because you need to do a lot of content during football season in a city like Philadelphia when you run this right. sort of a website. And now I'm the only content person. I've lost my only other writer. So I was like, I'll figure it out over the summer. So I would go days at a time over the summer with no new content on the site. And for everything we just talked about, you'll know how that was like a thing. I pride him every nine o'clock every weekday, you know, in a minimum, we would do three posts a day on a, on a slow day. So I was like, I got to figure it out. So I found a couple of guys who were readers of the sites. Um, yeah, Jeff and Mike, who, who, you know, and they liked the site. And I said, Hey, like it needs some money, right? I put something on the website in passing. They both reached out to me and I was like, what if we, this is right before the athletic got big. What if you guys invested some money? We tried to hire some notable like Philly writers and bloggers who have their own following and we create a subscription product. And this is right before this is like socially acceptable. There weren't the tools like Beehive and Ghost and, and Stripe, you know, to really make this work at the time. It wasn't easy to implement, but I was like, let's figure it out. So spent the whole summer kind of piecing this together. These guys kick in a relatively small amount of money to give me about six months of runway to hire a few people, a full timer, some contractors and launch a subscription version of the site that fall. And pocket the profits for me so I could live, you know? Um, so that happens. And, uh, you know, we, we get the team that is on the site today, Kevin Kincaid, Rush Joy, Bob Wankel, you know, Anthony Sanfilippo, these guys are still with the site, but what they didn't know at the time was I only had enough money to pay them for six months. Right. Yeah. And we had to figure out a model and we start the subscription model. And because the site was more gossipy, you know, at the time we had, we became more mainstream over the years, but it was still, we were never like deep dive into analytics, right? So we didn't have any one thing that we could like, when you're selling an audience online or a product, it needs to be niche and focused. And we were anything but. We covered all the teams in Philly and it was entertaining information, but none of it was like, like it wasn't hardcore for fantasy. It wasn't hardcore for gamblers. It wasn't like hardcore for diehards. It was just like, people passing the time and work. So we had scale, but we didn't have, we always talk about like depth or breadth. I did not have any depth with any one audience pocket. I just had, you know, so the subscription thing didn't work. We got like 300 subscribers and that wasn't going to cut it. So, you know, we, uh, I'll kind of shut up for a sec, but we, we didn't have a business model and I had six more months, basically six more months to figure it out. You go from, maybe one hot seat to, to, a, to another, um, where you have, uh, a personal situation that is not great. Um, but then you take on em employees and investors, and then th you know, what was based around that mo that model does not go great where are you mentally at this point, you know, and then walk us through those next steps. 
you'll, so you'll probably know this about me. Like, um, when I identify a problem or a, a solution or whatever, like I, I'm all in on it. Right. But I can be a touch slow in seeing the problem coming. I see it eventually. I, I see it, but I usually, I'm like, I'm usually focused on what I'm doing at the moment. And by the, I scan the horizon, like, you know, right before crossing the intersection, right? Instead of, you know, if you're using the crossing broad analogy, like instead of looking to see who's coming at that intersection while I'm a block away, I'm like, as I'm about to cross, I, you know, I turn and look like in business. And so I knew that I had six months to figure it out, but I was just kind of like, all right, I'm back into the content of the site now, you know? And I've always had this view. Alexis mentioned this in our last interview. She always had this view where her life, her business is going to work out. And I've always felt that. I was always like, I'm pretty good at what I do. I will figure it out. I've always been good at just figuring it out. Sometimes at the last minute, you know, I would do school projects like, you know, the morning they were due. I would write an eight page paper at like 4 a.m., right? And I was, I was just good at figuring things out. And that's, you know, it's not the best trait to have, you know, sometimes it can be good, but I wasn't thinking, I was like, all right, it's the fall. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. I'm recovering football. The site's good. The quality is great. The audience is growing. We still don't have the right business model, but like, okay, you know, this is good. We have a good product. Something good will happen. <laughs> um, so I had started over that last year as one of the fallback options. Instead of being a t-shirt affiliate, I saw how many shirts the site could sell when there was something interesting, when there was a cool shirt, a cool moment. And uh, so I built out our own Shopify store. I had found a supplier, a local supplier that instead of drop shipping the shirts, we would literally, part of the deal when my wife left her job was she was gonna help fulfill the shirts. Because before I had been an affiliate and I had done some drop shipping, we'd create a funny t-shirt. Well, when you do that, you only get like $5 a shirt you sell because you know, all the charges are in the, the, you pay for drop shipping, right? But I found a local supplier, we were selling t-shirts for $25. They would make them, you know, between six and $8 a shirt, right? Shipping, we would charge shipping. So we'd be able to profit like 15 to $20 a shirt we could sell if we just mailed them out on our own. Well, that was sustainable. And that was part of that like small mix of revenue that I hadn't lost when we were doing 100 t-shirts a month or something like that, right? Well, I had set this up. I had this model. We had a Shopify store. We had a supplier for t-shirts and this is, you know, luck. Sometimes you get the ball bouncing in your court. The Eagles, the end of 2017, the Eagles are really good that year. You know, at one point they're like 10 and one. I don't know. They're looking like they're going to go to the Super Bowl. And I know, you know, in this, the way sports apparel works is you sell a lot when teams are good and you sell none when they're bad. Right especially we had these unlicensed kind of funny slogan-y type t-shirts. So they're about to go, you know, it's late December. I'm thinking, all right, we're, we're starting to sell more shirts. They're going to make a playoff run. We got some cool, funny ideas. This will buy us another six months. Um, Carson Wentz, their starting quarterback, tears his ACL right before Christmas. I'm like, well, that's screwed. Well, you know, if anyone is a sports fan, the Eagles somehow overcome that. They go on to win the Super Bowl. And along the way, they just a number of these like obvious t-shirt examples come up. One of the players wears a dog mask on the field because they're underdogs. A guy gives a speech at the parade in a, in a goofy clown costume, right? All of these things that are like instant t-shirt ideas. So right as our six months is about to run out, uh, thankfully I had set up and you know, I'd press the right button on setting up the Shopify store. We sell you know, like, I don't know, like half a million dollars worth of t-shirts in the span of six weeks after the Super Bowl, right? 400, three, $350,000, $400,000 worth of shirts in six weeks, uh, then more throughout the rest of the year. So we, I got a new pro, I got another six months of, I got a year of runway now. So I've solved the problem. It's still not a scalable model unless we can repeat that every year, which we're not. Now I have a new problem, which is we had, we're fulfilling all of these t-shirts. <laughs> so we dropped the job shipping model to be more profitable. But now my wife and I, um, who's now pregnant again, are in the garage stuffing 10,000 plus shirts into envelopes, uh, to send out. So, you know, 
my, my intuition was right that things would take care of themselves. They did. We sold these shirts. It bought us plenty of more time. Uh, but you know, we actually had to send out the shirts now, <laughs> you know, a lot, a lot could be said for, um, your fortunes matching that of, uh, you know, the Phillies and the Eagles, you know, just, just when they had hit their pinnacle, it seemed it had been either your entrance or your continuation, you know, all the work that you had done. And it's almost as if, you know, some karma process was there with you, you know, not to be weird about it, but it certainly helped, you know, luck, luck always comes into this. Uh, yeah. in some way, you know, it's where hard work and preparation meet is where luck shows up. Yeah. And I mean, we always joke about pressing the right button, right? And you find it and you press it and you, you press it. And, you know, look, I mean, if you do the right things and you work hard, you, you're always going to need some level of luck, right? I, I benefited from, I think, an outsized portion of fortuitous bounces at the right time. Now, I'll give some, myself some credit, like setting up that Shopify store was always with the idea that, Hey, if one of our teams wins a championship, we're going to sell a lot of shirts. You know, I knew that we would make money, but you can't, you have no idea when that's going to happen. I mean, in Philadelphia, it's only happened twice in my whole lifetime. So you can't really plan for that, but you can be in a position to take advantage of something when it happens. So, you know, I think I would give myself credit for that, but not give myself credit for that being, had that not happened, I don't know where I'd be today. Right. Yep. So, you know, you got to get those right bounces. Um, and then, you know, to kind of move things along here, the next one happens, right? And this is where it becomes a scalable business. So the Eagles win the Super Bowl is early 2018. I got literally my good chunk of my spring, late winter and spring was spent in my garage. Thankfully, we had a team of people doing the content that I could step aside and I'm now sending shirts. So, you know, this doesn't scale, but it's, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's something you had to do. Um, and then right as that's that wave is ending, um, you know, I'm finally like, I can relax, like income is stabilized site has stabilized. It's good. You know, it's summer, like for the first time in like a year and a half, I could like at least be a normal human being, not stressing about, you know, fulfilling shirts, losing my livelihood, all that Supreme court overturns PASPA, which paves the way for legalized sports betting, which is how you and I come together, you know, which you described so well in the last show. And it's like that background in affiliate marketing that I talked about earlier. One of the things anyone who's in affiliate marketing knows is that gambling insurance finance, things like credit cards, right. Have these massive affiliate fees because customers can be worth so much money. And I knew this, we didn't do gambling at my old job, but I knew the, the opportunity. And I remember speaking to someone at one of the sports books who had reached out to us because New Jersey and Pennsylvania, again, another fortuitous bounce are going to be the first two States to legalize online betting. So the Eagles win the Super Bowl. I get lucky, I get lucky again, that this new business model that's changing all of sports media right now gets cleared, right? And then even luckier that the, that basically Philadelphia was the test market for online sports betting and we're the independent website in Philadelphia. And one of these, these sports books tells me they're going to pay maybe $300 for every single new customer. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, we have hundreds of thousands of readers now. If we can just convert a sliver of them, you know, you, you kind of, you know, in business, sometimes you'll run like math on your phone, you know, you'll in your calculator and you'll be like, well, what if I do 1%? And you're like, well, that can't be right. And then you do it again. And you're like, oh my God, like that can't be right. And so I knew like, well, this is the business model that we could scale with. We can become a sports betting affiliate in Philadelphia and make more money than the site has made in one year than it has in the last eight and not have to rely on some unlikely bounce or investment or team winning. And, and then I was like, I was all back in. I spent the, as basically, I never really wrote consistently for the site again, the Eagles won the Super Bowl, And that was like, you know, like literally went out on top as a blogger. I've written a little since, but like I was the everyday blogger on that site till the day the Eagles won the Super Bowl, And then I spent the next spring fulfilling shirts and then sports betting gets legalized. And I'm like, I'm going to figure out how to become a major affiliate. 
and let the, the guys do the content. And this is a business opportunity. And I'm going to sp I spent that whole summer learning SEO, learning traditional digital marketing, all of the things that I never thought about. Cause we just had like this viral social media audience. I knew I'd have to do more to really like maximize the opportunity. And, and that's what I started doing in the, in the summer of 2018. You know, and because of fandom being the way it is, it crosses state lines too. I mean, you're not, you're not just relying on Philadelphia and the Pennsylvania area. I mean, there's plenty of Phillies fans, Sixers, Eagles fans in New Jersey as well. So with Jersey going first and PA second, I mean, you, you truly are probably the most well-positioned privately owned sports blog in the country, you know, for the launch of sports betting. Yeah. I mean, in hindsight, just kind of knowing how the numbers shook out and stuff, I mean, probably the most well positioned, I'll use air quotes here, you know, people are listening, but like media outlet to capitalize on that initial wave. Cause it was just, it's me and Mike and Jeff, you know, who, who invest in money and have a chunk of the site. And it's like, oh my God, like we are sitting on an audience that is worth millions of dollars if we do this right. Yeah. Um, and to their credit, they kicked in a little bit more money. Cause I was like, Hey guys, this is, this is now a thing. Um, you know, and I, we just basically reinvested that money we had made on the Super Bowl into let's, let's pay people, you know, let's pay more freelancers. Let's focus on this type of content and we're going to create betting affiliate content. And yeah, I mean, you can't get luckier for anyone who's not familiar. Philadelphia sits on the river that separates Philadelphia or Pennsylvania and New Jersey. So 40% of our audience is in New Jersey. 50% is in Pennsylvania and then 10% is scattered elsewhere pretty much. Um, so I knew like, wow, this is, you know, we're going to, if we do this right, we'll make a lot of money. There's, there's no way we won't. So all right, in our last few minutes here, where do you want to take this? We, we covered a lot of our getting together on the previous episode where you interviewed me. How do you want to cap this one off? I mean, I, you know, live here and deciding how we want to do it. I mean, you, your story is amazing. I, I, um, just learned a lot. Shocked that you cried. You're such a sissy, but you know, <laughs> I know you can get emotional. Um, I, I will tell you one thing. One, just I'll add. Uh, so, I was not aware of how close our timeline I interacting was with your lowest point. I, in my mind, I thought there was more separation there. So hearing that that was actually closer. It's interesting, and I think it adds, you know, it adds to my view of of, of where we were, uh, you know, four or five years ago, uh, coming into this. But um, why don't we go with one of our traditional questions? Then, you know, what do you think now? And this this may have changed over time. You know, what's the one thing that you cannot do without, could not do without? You know, past present tense. Uh, you know, to run the business. Um, before I answer, let me, I want to answer the first part. So I, yeah. I, people should go listen to the episode with you about our sports betting affiliate journey. Cause I think we covered it right. Um, and the, and our acquisition so that, you know, we really got into the weeds there, but to, to your point, it was, um, I had made a number of mistakes on the business side. But to your point, like you thought, hey, it was more successful, right? The site all the while, you know, this is a business show, so I'm trying to talk about like what I'm thinking about. All the while, the website itself is great, save for the summer where I didn't write anything because I was trying to get investors. The audience is growing. We're relevant in Philly. We're, you know, we're starting to get credentialed. I'm doing media opportunities. And there are a few years there, you know, from 2013 to 2017 where I'm making I would consider a really good salary for any sports writer, let alone someone who's running their own sports website. So I'm feeling great. The site by all outward signs is very good. We're getting attention, you know, very like, you know, prominent locally. And so the hardest part for me at that low moment was like, man, everyone thinks we're doing great. And we were, but now we're not like all of a sudden we're not. And then for the next two years, it's up and down. You got the super, you got the investment. Good. You know, then the money's running out. Then Super Bowl, Oh, good. And now I got to fulfill the shirts. And like, I was just waiting for this business model that became the sports betting affiliate. But I think I had made a number of mistakes along the way to that made it so volatile there. The site was always good. I should probably have taken 20% of my time to really think about, 
a diverse business model to some ads, some apparel, right? Rather, I would just go all in on one thing that was working. And sometimes that is what you have to do when you're like literally self-employed and it's one or two people. But to anyone listening, never assume that, you know, never let something become more than 50%, you know, let alone of, of your income, because if it goes away, you, you need to make sure you're covered. So I wish I had done that sooner. Um, you know, and then obviously the, the gambling opportunity worked out for, you know, for both of us and it, it scaled. Um, yeah. I don't know what you asked about the tool, the one tool. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say Chartbeat, um, which, you know, is now sort of replaced, although it still exists. It's kind of expensive um, by real Google real time analytics, looking at something in hindsight, and it's tough with podcasts and YouTube that that doesn't exist as well for non-written forms. I think it will eventually. No. Um, but seeing traffic data and audience data in real time instead of like in a monthly report is so impactful. Even though you can break down reports by where and when people came, feeling it in the moment when you post a piece of content and seeing exactly what headlines, what topics, what referral sources make the most impact allows you to constantly refine the type of content you're doing and play to your audience, you know, if, if that's what you're going for, right? That to me, if it wasn't for that, I never would have figured it out because immediately I had this Facebook page, I could post articles and get people to come. But by seeing the real time traffic, I knew exactly when to post them. And I knew exactly what people wanted. And I would post something that I thought was good. I'd be like, well, no one's reading that. Then I'd post something that I thought sucked and it got 10 times as many views and people read all 1500 words. And I was like, I'm going to do that again. This is my thing. And we would start posting about like the local media. I didn't think that would do as well as it did, but we would post about the competition between local sports talk radio stations or an Eagles writer punched another Eagles writer at a press conference. It's wild. And that was one of our most popular posts ever. And you don't, by that point I knew, but like you develop that instinct by seeing a real time. So I'd say Chartbeat or Google Analytics or any sort of real time analytics is is really good if you're creating content. Yeah, I, f I feel like there's we probably could have broken this in two parts, just yours alone, because there's there's so much to it, and there's probably another episode here of learnings and business intelligence and analytics, the things that we have learned that we could probably break out for listeners in the future too. But um, that was that was great. Kyle, I, I, I feel like I learned a lot about you. Tell everybody where they, where they can find you on social. Yeah. So, uh, Kyle Scott L, uh, on Twitter is probably the best spot. And then obviously our show at monetize media HQ. All right. That was awesome. Thanks, Kyle. Tell two friends, tell two friends. I tell you, it's your job. You got to do it now. It's your job. Today. See, you see what happens. <laughs> tell two friends. Cause remember. You tell two friends, and they tell two friends, and and then make sure to uh, tag us on social media, monetize media HQ. Um, you know, with those friends, or just you know, hey, tell us that you told two friends, and if you want, we'll review your business, get in contact with you anyway. We are here to help uh, grow and monetize your business, so we appreciate any kind of support you have, and. Please make sure to rate us for five stars where you listen to your favorite podcast. We certainly will appreciate it. See you. Thanks, guys. See you next time.